I, so I, I've only I've only looked at a few tests in this class, or essay tests, and but I looked at the organization because that doesn't take long and it looks good. It looks like people were ready. Some of you got to be more concise. Some of you try to write your entire essay in your organization. <laughs> I know I said you could bring one in, but remember you only have a limited amount of time when you actually take you would do it all in class. So you're not going to be able to write it. Yeah, some people gave me like three page organization and wrote a two page essay. I thought that was pretty funny. But I said you could bring it in, so I'm not. We just, time, the clock is always running, so we just got to be concise about that. But, the most people I looked at really did prepare, and I can tell you were, you were thought about the question, thought about a good answer, and that's, that's great. There's always going to be little things, but looked good. Oh, we have to have a test next week. Next week's a three-day week. And Wednesday's a PSAT, and so I don't want to do it on the same day. Even though you guys will be done, the, the test will be through fourth, and so it messes up my other three classes. What days do we have off next week? Hmm? There's days where we have off. Yeah, Tuesday, you, you have uh, Tuesday and Friday. <laughs> Thursday, Friday. We do not have school Thursday and Friday. Yes, you have to come here. I know most of you would just come here and just kind of mill around. I don't know what to do. But I'm not going to be here. Oh, yeah. People are just, just kind of lurking about. It's actually kind of funny to argue, which is kind of funny. And I was like, when the seniors graduate, then they come back and be like, guys, you're done. We don't have to come back. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and finish up the federal chair. We talked about this. Someone else had their hands up and I ignored them. So it's not on purpose. Vic, did you have your hand up? Uh, listen, why, do, why do we have these days Because I'm a nice guy. You know, I just do things to help you. I don't like to brag, but I gave you a book. I don't know how that's bragging. It's the MEA convention. And so the Montana Education Association, which is the teachers union. And so part of the contract is, you know, we, we're on a contract. And part of it is we get these days off. So... If we want, we can go to this convention. It's in Helena. What's that? Yeah, there are people, a lot of people come. You'd be shocked. Yeah. But they have classes. Actually, there, there's a couple. There's always a couple, actually, pretty interesting. And then ones that I would rather not I would rather anything else in the world. But, you know, that's what I like. All right. Please take a look at this book. And it, it is a great little review. And when we get near the end, it's really it's just a nice thing to have. For example, we have a great purple lock cartoon from Watergate. Okay, so it is. I love. Here's my favorite political cartoon: purple lock, purple lock. Right. Wait a minute. Now no brushes. Yeah. yeah. They said it's fractured yeah. up to highlight. I don't want to use them. Sure, whatever you want to do. <laughs> what leg was it again? My left one. Was it at your right yesterday? My left. Hey, what game are you playing? <laughs> 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 All right, so we already talked about this. We got through a lot of this already. We talked about the main issues that divide the parties up. Who's this guy? Jefferson. Good guess, but no, they kind of look alike. Someone said Madison. Jefferson. Washington. Hamilton. Remember what I told you, especially portraits. <laughs> Senior citizen, <laughs> women, or two your height. John Adams. Yes. Who's going to have a John Quincy Adams, his son? And, okay, Republican, Federalist, basically Federalist. Washington was no party, even though he leaned Federalist. What? His face in that painting looks like he's either really annoyed or really mad. Well, because everyone copied Parson Weems' painting of him, and, the, and so everyone copies that portrait of him, so that's when they drew it. He kind of like Partially because his teeth hurt. His jaw hurt all the time. So he always looks uncomfortable. Yes. What's a Federalist? What's a Federalist? The opposite of a Republican. No, Federalist is one of the two first political parties. And the Federalists were Hamilton. That's Hamilton's party. And 
We'll get to more detail about them, but the, the Republicans were the other party. You'll see them in textbooks as Democratic Republicans. They're not, de that is actually improper. They do that because they want to make them different than the Republicans that will come about in 1854. They actually called themselves Republicans. They were Republicans. But you'll see them as DR, Democratic Republicans. We call them Republicans in Europe. That's what they call themselves. So, one more thing before we get started on some notes. I did mention the, the Whiskey Rebellion. Remember we mentioned that when we talked about the Assumption Bill. So I do have, oh, I don't know what that is. Well, I thought that was funny. But. I know what a lot of you are thinking. I'm interested in the Whiskey Rebellion, but I want to know the point of view of a crab. Yes, I'm with you, a crab. This is Chester the Crabs who went to the Whiskey Rebellion. That's Chester the Crab. See, so Chester the Crab tells you, yeah, you don't get history, but rarely, it's rare. You get history from the point of view of a crustacean. And now we get that opportunity. So as you can see, there is an evil leer from Hamilton. There is a drunken crab. Uh, that's Tar and Feather and Tats Collector. Hamilton saying the federal treasury is done. Washington upset, saying look, right? Army, Washington runs off the sunset. Okay, so Chester the Crab. So from now on, all history will be through the eyes of a crab. Isn't this awesome? Hmm? <laughs> Squids don't know history. They're too involved in history. <laughs> but let's get to another thing. This is what we have to get for our notes. The Anglo Anglo. The Anglo French War. <laughs> and one more thing. I was curious. Let's see, two point five servings. It'll be 21 grams of sugar per serve. <laughs> 116 grams. Yeah. Are you the one that talked about how they're salt and They make you drink more. And then they use more sugar to cover up the salt. It's a third squash. Okay, so. <laughs> Now I forgot what I was going to say. Thanks for the Gatorade. Oh, and you bring water out. Yes, that's water. <laughs> that was pretty good. All right. Angle means British. It's named after the Angles, which is everyone's favorite uh, third century AD Germanic tribe. I know some of you are thinking, what about the Picts? No, they're sticking with the Angles. Angle French War. Now they have been fighting pretty much since the 17th century, but with the Angle French War here, it's from the American point of view. And we're talking about the wars that began after the French Revolution started. The French Revolution began in 1789. And basically all of Europe was at war by 1791. And this war would go on until 1815. And once the revolution devolved down into the terror, where they began looking for enemies and enemies all over that were going to defeat the revolution, they executed the king and queen of France. The revolutionaries did. And that would kind of trigger this worldwide war. And now I can finally use the Marie Antoinette doll in context. <laughs> Marie Antoinette, the French queen. In fact, it was her relatives. Her, it was her brother was king of Austria. The emperor of Austria, I mean. And they were worried that he might attack France. Isn't this good to get a little bit of European history? <laughs> Yeah. The most, maybe the most important event of European history is the French Revolution, so naturally that won't be on the AP European exam. Here is Marie Antoinette. Are you ready? And of course, that's what happened to Marie Antoinette. <laughs> yes, my Marie Antoinette action figure, and yes, she was a redhead. <laughs> now, Carl Jung, the psychologist. My head that stays on. Okay, he did not die. That way. Don't fall. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this? Freud. Sigmund Freud. Naturally, that bring out to an end to psychologists. All right, so. <laughs> <laughs> what? It looks like Colonel Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> well, Freud liked fried chicken and, and, and cocaine. <laughs> And heroin. Ah, yeah. oh, Sigmund Freud. Hey, 
piece. This is the problem with you guys are distracting me, and I'm letting you. <laughs> but what happened was this: this massive war began, and the big thing is everyone attacked France at once, essentially, and France did incredibly well. In fact, we changed the entire nature of history. Nationalism came out of the French Revolution. We'll get to more nationalism right later on. This this is an earth-shattering event, but it divided the two parties up. You know, we already have the issues of the Assumption Bill, the Bank of the United States, and tariffs. And now, who's supporting who? Who supported the French, the Federalists or the Republicans? Exactly, the Republicans supported them. Jefferson saw this as his revolution. And even after it devolved into the guillotine being used thousands of times in these mass executions and the terror, he still kind of thought of it as my revolution and still a little bit uh, very idealized it. The Federalist? Well, think about Hamilton. Yes, he wanted to be independent from, from Britain. He fought in the war, but he admired the Industrial Revolution. He admired their system, he admired their finance. And this is where you're going to get the really big divisive parts of the parties. You see this foreign affairs at its very day. You have issues about Iran or Syria today. When I was a youth growing up, it was the Cold War, and how divisive, bitterly divided that was. Really, what's Cold War? I know mean, everyone thinking, was it like, yeah, War of eighteen twelve? Not quite. <laughs> but the thing was, now you have Republicans calling Federalists traitors, want to bring back the monarchy, and George Washington, who was technically no party. But the Federalists, kind of, they supported him. They're calling Washington nothing more than a monarchist who wants to bring back a king. In the man who gave up power, they're calling him a king. and going to bring back the tyranny of King George III. Which is just ridiculous. It shows you how dirty politics got. And you have Federalists calling Thomas Jefferson a revolutionary who wants to bring the guillotine to, to uh, the United States. If you think politics are dirty today, think about that for a second. Of course, remember, this was all new. There were no political parties before, and all of a sudden they created this. That's why there's going to be hundreds of duels between politicians. The most famous is when the vice president will shoot Alexander Hamilton. Yes? So, the different parties supported the same side of the mm -hmm. Wait, so. Federalists in the United States were more leaning towards pro British. Republicans were saying, well, no, we should be pro French. So did the Republicans, like, because the French were under Robespierre, right? Yeah. So did they support him? Yeah. Oh, I know. I know. But think about also, you know, early 1790s, you only got tidbits of information once more. It's not like today. But we're going to have a situation where Federalists in charge are going to go in an undeclared war against France. And then Republicans in 1812 will go to war against Britain. Yeah. How long is what? Like what year did the whole start? 1791-1815. And so the whole thing is, all these other issues are important, but war and who's supporting the government or not, that's just so divisive. That terrified Washington. This whole thing just, in fact, he was really worried about it. So we have this war beginning. Washington did everything he could to stay neutral. He made a neutrality proclamation, and this is it, the neutrality proclamation, and George Washington and the Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson initialed it down here. But the United States could not remain neutral. Don't worry about impressment right now. But the Royal Navy was stopping American-owned merchant vessels and keeping them from trading with France. French pirates, called Corsairs, were stopping American ships to keep American-owned merchant vessels from trading with Britain. We're not talking about U.S. government ships. We're talking about merchants in the U.S. So pirates are stopping them. Think about it. You know, Britain doesn't want to trade with France, and vice versa. This is economic warfare. U.S. ships are being stopped. Washington's trying to maintain neutrality, we don't have a navy at all, virtually no army. 
militias, but you can't count on those. And then Washington, desperate to try to come up with some kind of agreement, would sign Jay's Treaty with Britain. We call it Jay's Treaty because it's named after the person who negotiated it. Right here, John Jay. This is the actual treaty. It's the order of the government and council for the regulation of commerce between the province and the United States of America. That's what we call it, Jay's Treaty. Does it make sense now? Jay's Treaty. John Jay was one of the authors of the Federalist Papers. He is the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Jay. Now think about that for a second. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is going to Paris to negotiate a treaty. I mean, going to London to negotiate a treaty. That's the job of the Secretary of State, but Washington did not trust Jefferson, and Jefferson soon will get out of that position. <laughs> It's unimaginable today, the Chief Justice, going to Iran and negotiating a treaty about nuclear weapons. Speaking of that, who is the Chief Justice? A slightly important person. And they name whatever court is in session, they name it after the Chief Justice. So this was the Jay Court, then there'll be the Marshall Court, etc. Then the Taney Court. Who's Chief Justice? Would it help if I just arbitrarily ran and but ran? It'll be arbitrary. You won't have a choice. Put someone in the stocks and you'll be next if you don't have to. Who thinks that's a good idea? Victor and something. <laughs> what do you want? It's a name that's really difficult to remember. John Roberts. He's the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court today, so it's the Roberts Court. He's 58. I think he's 5'11. Made that up. <laughs> he was appointed by George W. Bush. He'll be in there for a long time. You know, you can see easily another 25 years. I mean, that's not unimaginable. So, you know, George W. Bush, his influence is going to go a long ways. That's why that appointing justice is such a big part of being president. Well, Jay went there, and this treaty is we don't need to know the details. All we need to know is it was very pro bridge the United States just basically accepted what Britain was doing. Stopping some ships. In fact, Britain still kept forts here. Didn't do anything about those forts. They're still there around the Great Lakes. So here's the point. The treaty did not really change anything. This treaty, in reality, was a pro-British treaty because they had the power. Britain had the power. They could negotiate a better treaty. Washington and... There, his administration was desperate to get some kind of treaty that would keep the United States out of war. But the Republicans, they use this as, told you so. We told you they were pro-British, and now look what they've done. Not only have they signed a treaty that pretty much makes us an ally, or like a subsidiary of Britain, they throw their water bottles on the ground while allying themselves against France. Because think about it, Britain and France are fighting a war. If we sign a treaty that's a virtual alliance with Britain, indirectly that means we're fighting France. Actually, the, after this treaty, the Corsairs attacked even more. And so this treaty really was used as a political tool. That's where you're going to get Washington called every name in the book trick, wrapped around trade. Yeah. Um, Corsairs, those French pirates. Okay. It's also a fighter plane from World War II. Right. You, you want to talk about the fighter plane World War II? Had a big engine. Yes. Um, I'm all confused. So, was this war in France? It was in Europe. But it was raised basically all around the borders of France. So, how come we cared not? Well, think about American tr merchants want to trade with Britain or France. They want to do trade with them. And what was happening is American ships on the way to Britain, French pirates were stopping the ships. So we're involved because, okay. and vice versa, the Royal Navy, the British Navy was stopping American ships trying to France. And this will eventually be one of the main reasons for the War of 1812, but also another war we'll get to in a second. So now the divide is there. The Federalists and the Republicans are both calling themselves traitors, un-American, and we have Oh, we should get the Washington's farewell address. I was going to be election, but I forgot to put it this way. 
Washington would leave office in 1797. Do you remember this election in 1796? He would leave. After two terms, he was absolutely exhausted. And he gave a farewell address. As he saw it, it was a warning. And he wrote it out. This is one of the uh, rough drafts. You can see this is it. You see some of the lines where he crossed it out. That's his actual rough draft. I have it in my desk. And I, he asked me. And then someone read it to Congress. Today, the President Obama will read his in January. That's where he gets on this. And in it, he made two warnings. Because he saw this as the United States is still very vulnerable and very good chance it won't make it or be broken up. It's a massive country. And the West, being like Illinois or Tennessee, you know, they could break away at any moment. The two warnings were this. Number one, the first thing, avoid foreign entanglements. Avoid foreign entanglements like military alliances with the piggy don't join in wars. Stay out of the war in Europe. He was worried that all this talk about tra traitors and the disagreement, disagreement between the parties will escalate to war, which happens right now. Nobody wants to admit they're soft on terrorism. When I was you, nobody wanted to admit they're soft on communism. So we end up fighting wars. But so he's actually pretty correct about this in a lot of ways. Not saying that we should totally get out of foreign affairs, but that's what he meant. Number two, avoid political parties. He still believed that somehow we're all patriots. Why can't we agree? But the thing is, as we saw with Hamilton and Jefferson, they have diff there's different visions for what direction the country is going to go. And we are a winner-take-all system. Therefore, we're going to have two parties. But he still believed they could do that. But actually, there's nothing wrong with political disagreements. In fact, that's how things get done. You disagree, you come up with a solution, you compromise. The whole country's built on compromise. So that's not a bad thing. But he somehow thought they could come together. Washington was also elitist. Yes, he believed in liberty, but he did not want to give too much power to the illiterate masses. This cartoon's supposed to show this. It's a, actually, it's a wood carving, and then they watercolored it. It's supposed to be Washington warning people not to pull apart the edifice of state. This is liberty and independence. If they pull it apart, the country will topple. That's trying to avoid political parties. Of course, he's going to be ignored. There'll be one other, one other farewell address we'll get to, and that's Eisenhower. Same kind of deal, and of course, he's going to be ignored too about building up too much of a military. Well, the election of 1796 then would be the first rule of contested election, and it was bitter. Now, the candidates for office did not run. There was no formal campaign at all like today. Federalists in Congress asked the vice president, this matronly looking John Adams, to run. Republicans in Congress, caucus, which means got together, and they chose Jefferson. There was no campaign. Any campaign as we saw it would be their allies in different newspapers would write articles, but there was no formal campaign. And I told you this before, nobody really campaigned for themselves until well, the end of the 19th century. William Jennings Bryan was the first one to really go out and campaign for himself. Most of the time, others did it. And you notice we have the different colors for the states, which we are so used to now if you look at any maps today. Remember, state assemblies pick the electors, and most of the states are winner take all. Because, in, for example, in Massachusetts, which is John Adams State, they picked all Federalists. That's Massachusetts back then. And you know, all 16 electors are going to vote for Adams. The same with Georgia, South Carolina, they picked Republicans. And you'll notice one of the electors in Virginia, Jefferson's home state, didn't like Jefferson and voted for Adams. One more thing. How many members of the House of Representatives does Virginia have if it has 20 electors for the Republican and one for the Federalist? How many members of the House? Now, some of you are either, now you might know, but a word is a trick question. Yes, it's a question. How many electors does Montana have today? How many? 
Three. How many members of the Senate do we have? So how many members of the House? How many members of the House does Virginia have? Nineteen. Nineteen members of the House. So that's the most populous state. And in Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, New York. And so with that, you look at that, all of the federal support, for the, for the most part, in the Northeast, the Republican Party is a West and the Southern Party. But look at the vote. There are 139 total electors. 71. 70 is the majority. Adams won by one elector. There was no election, by the way. Like today, there's an election day. Back then, no. States started picking their electors in early September, all the way through December. And then in January 18, or January 1796, they went to, sorry, January 1797, they went to um, New York and made their votes. Today, in Jan early January 2017, they'll go to Washington DC and formally choose the president. And these colors don't mean anything, they're just to differentiate them. You still have the territories. 71 votes. I should show you this then. What does it look like today? So we're going to get all these maps. The blue state, red state, I told you this, where it came from, do you remember? It's the election of 2000. And it was such a contested election that it kept showing the different you know, the electoral map and the contested state of Florida. And since in that election, all of the major networks used blue for, Republic, or blue for Democrats and red for Republicans. That's where you get now it's blue meaning Democrats, red meaning Republicans. 538 is the best, or is considered to be one of the most accurate election forecasts. This along with the Princeton elect Election Consortium, of course. And this is what they have to, this is, let's refresh it. Of seven minutes ago, their polls only forecast. They predict, and so that's with the red state, blue states, and... So the blue states are what they predict will go to Hillary Clinton, the Democratic candidate, and the red states to Trump. The lighter the color means the closer the election is right now. And they they think it's an 83% polls only chance that Clinton will win. Is Arizona blue or red? Huh? Arizona. Arizona is pink. Now they give what they do with their polls, they come up with they, this side as a formula. To figure out a percentage of victory. So Arizona, that's how close they think it is. What's Montana? That's the I think Montana's probably closer to 100 percent for Trump. Look at California. <laughs> Utah's actually usually that's 99, usually that's 100 percent Republican, but now it's only 97.4. There's Oklahoma, <laughs> Texas. Let's get to another state. What other one do you want? <laughs> yeah, and that's it's going to go that way. You know, Alabama, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma, they're all going to go for Trump. But the closest is New Hampshire. All these states are going to go for Trump. So that's what it looks like today. I just wanted to give you know, the same thing. Remember, it's winner take all. And if this election, why we're stuck with Electoral College. I'll show you why in a second. That's what they say the electoral votes would be right now. <laughs> yeah, I don't see Gary Johnson winning one elector. It's just their formula gives him that. And my guess is he'll go down to about, I bet, I'd be shocked if he gets over 4%. Because, you know, third party takes away votes from somebody else, and they always drop it. Always. And Georgia. All right, so. All right, then let's get to one more thing that we have. But remember, each elector had two votes. Two votes? This won't be a problem, will it? Yes. Here's how the votes actually went. So all 71 Federalists voted for Adams. But then only 59 voted for the person they thought would be the Vice President Thomas Pink. 
and 11 voted for Oliver Ellsworth, which I know, that's who I wanted, Matt Walsh, of Connecticut. What that meant is, the person with the second most votes is Jefferson. So, the Federalist Adams became president, the Republican Jefferson became vice president. That would be no problem at all, right? Not a big deal. Now think of it this way. Let's say all 71 Federalists voted for Adams, and then all 71 voted for Pinckney. Who wins? It's a tie with most of the House. You see why they changed the Constitution? It's because of this election, and then in 1800, that happened. That happened. That's why in 1801, the Constitution was amended to say the electors have one vote for president, one vote for vice president. But that's why we're stuck with that system today. It's this election of what happened here to keep the opposing parties who they didn't, remember, they didn't pick parties what happened. Madison thought all the elections will go to the House. But now we're stuck with the Electoral College. It's right here, 1796. And so, almost immediately, we have to get one big event happening. Not a big deal, just war. The X. Yeah. Oh, almost forgot. Let's skip that. Little, we're going to skip ahead. The XYZ affair. And the XYZ affair is this bribery scandal where an, um, two, actually, two American diplomats, Timothy Pinkney, um, Pinkney uh, was one of them. They were going to France to try to negotiate a treaty to stop the Corsair. Remember, I mentioned the Corsairs were attacking? And this is Lady Columbia. She represents the United States, and she is trying to see the French foreign minister. You don't need to know his name. I just won't say his name because his name is relatively fun to say. Talleyrand. And Talleyrand, Talleyrand was amazing. He was foreign minister for Louis XVI, and then the revolutionary government, then Napoleon, and then Louis XVIII who replaced Napoleon. He kept his head through all of these. I mean, literally. I mean, we're talking the literal head. He's a remarkable survivor. Well, this is when she, when she, come on, when the, when the American diplomats tried to see Talleyrand, three French diplomats called X, Y, and Z, demanded a bribe, tribute. And this infuriated Adams. Absolutely infuriated. Lurking about my class. Yes, I did. Did you see? You want to come and finish up we have a guest, an expert of the X Y Z affair. <laughs> I was the Z guy. You're the Z. You're more welcome to sit at the desk. I'm going to share. I can hear you clear down the hall. But oh, I'm loud. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They hear me up the stairs. <laughs> I expect you to be this loud next period. No, uh, yeah, at least. So the uh, so French diplomats. <laughs> The United States. And Adams is furious. I'll talk quiet. How dare you? <laughs> you wouldn't even know how to respond if I talk like that. How dare you demand a bribe? That is the absolute measure of disrespect. The United States won their independence, France was their ally, and now they do that. <coughs> When Adams heard about that, now remember, it's going to take a couple weeks, and a couple weeks, or six weeks, six weeks to get back, six weeks to have their information, pulled out the diplomats, and that is going to lead to an undeclared war called the, everybody's favorite war, the Quasi War. Oh, I didn't say this about Lady Columbia. Where did I go? Where's Columbia? Why is she out uh, feathers? That represented the United States into the 20th century. And then Uncle Sam kind of replaced it. But feathers. What's the Boston Tea Party? What did they dress up as? Why Mohawks? What? Liberty. American Indians stood for liberty. That's kind of strange contradiction of the way they treated American Indians. We want your land, but you represent liberty. That's what they meant here. And so... 
There is a quasar war, which is undeclared war between the naval war between the United States and France. And this is one of my favorite all-time political cartoons. They would do political political cartoons. They would do a wood carving, and they would use that in the printing press, so they could print that right down to come up with an imprint. And then this was watercolor. And I love the political cartoons at this time because I have no idea what's heck's going on. <laughs> All I know for sure is I believe this is supposed to be American diplomats. That's Talleyrand, <laughs> which is just awesome. No, I don't know why Talleyrand's in a turban. Why he has five heads? Well, that's obvious. And <laughs> here, it's supposed to be the French Revolution. That's Haiti, which was going through a slave rebellion, which we'll get to a little bit later. And that's supposed to be a caricature of French liberty. You know how awful she looks? And anybody, what has she just done? That's the guillotine. And if you look carefully, that's blood squirting out of a, of a torso. I don't need to bring Marie Antoinette back into this, do I? Okay. <laughs> but that is the quasi war. <laughs> okay, that's a great cartoon, right? <laughs> Halloween's coming up. <laughs> yes. I love the yeah, Tyler is awesome. But the last thing for today. So we had to create a navy. Out of, out of scratch. From scratch. Well, there was already a Department of War, so they created a Department of the Navy and raised taxes, like the whiskey tax to pay for ships. So here are the Republicans saying, look at what they've done. Undeclared war. Created a navy. Raised our taxes. Everything we told you they're going to do. Tyranny. The Federalists are tyrants. And we had to create from scratch. These are small, fast naval vessels called frigates. And that's the Constellation, which has been rebuilt. And now you can go look at this ship. It's still there. In Baltimore, this is the Constitution. Yeah. So, what's the Basically, the Department of Navy, kind of like the Department of War, they oversee the building of the new Navy. The Constitution is still in the United States Navy today. A ship that was made in 1798. So, has anyone been to Boston? Let's go! We're only. <laughs> Did you go on the Constitution? Oh, it's awesome. It is so cool. And they have a U.S. Navy crew. When I went there, my tour guide was a chief petty officer. It was, it was a blast. Yeah, that ship is still in the active United States Navy today. It's a big deal to be on that ship. Because it's a sailing vessel. There's no motor. And in 2003, that ship was used because we used our entire fleet to bombard the shores of Iraq when we invaded Iraq. <laughs> now, some people actually kind of believe me. No, we did not use a ship from 1798. And Iraq doesn't have a shore. It's like the shores of Wyoming. All right, have a good day, everybody. But we're not going to make Montana again. Well done, everybody. You did good. And I filmed this. You walking in with the fly.